Hi, and welcome to Financial Statement Analysis, Chapter 14. Let's first start talking about the major financial statements. You most likely have encountered these financial statements before in a previous course. Generally, the introduction to these financial statements occur in, say, an introduction to business course and then is further uh, extrapolated in a financial accounting or accounting one type of course. So I'm assuming that you have somewhat a familiarity with these major financial statements. The first one being an income statement. Now the income statement is sort of like a pay stub or your the portion of your paycheck that details the amount of money you're receiving. So at the very top you get your gross income and the bottom you have your net income after you pay for all the expenses that get taken out of your paycheck. So the income statement is a lot like that, but for a company. So it's gonna, it's gonna detail the earnings of the company, the expenses of the company, the taxes of the company to get to a net profit. Now there's an accounting earnings, which the firm is, was what the firm is reporting on the income statement, but the economic earnings are the real flow of cash flow a firm could pay without um, in impairing any productive capacity. So there are two types of earnings. So accounting is one set of statements that follow a particular set of guidelines to develop net profit. But don't be confused. Net profit isn't exactly the money that's in the bank. That would be the uh, cash flow that's retained. So th think of accounting earnings as you know a close number but economic earnings is more of reality okay now the balance sheet so the balance sheet is another accounting statement and it looks at a financial position at a particular time so basically stops time and says okay what assets do you have what liabilities do you have and what's the remaining equity so it's only good for the the particular time it's looked at because the next day things can change so and it's the way you call the balance sheet because the assets need to equal the liabilities and the equity. Now, the third major financial statement would be the statement of cash flows. So this is a statement that we've talked about uh, before. And this is going to measure the cash going in and out of the company through operations, through in investing opportunities, and through financing opportunities. So the financial statement cash flow is going to look at you know all the cash receipts that's the cash coming in and all the cash payments the cash going out to really get an idea of how much cash is left over so oftentimes I would describe this as say you had a pile of cash on the table and then a line of people who you need to pay so as they step up to the table you keep paying the different people uh, and then you have a smaller and smaller pile of cash on your table would be the cash outflow maybe on the other side of the table will be a lot of people who need to pay you money that they may have borrowed from you or you sold them stuff and that would be the cash inflows so at the end of at the end of the day when all the people are gone whatever cash is left on the table is the remaining cash okay so let's look at the income statement of Home Depot so here's a very typical income statement where we have at the beginning and this is expressed whenever they say uh, dollar sign millions, dollar sign thousands, it just means they're truncating the uh, zeros here to make it more readable. Okay, so this would be the percentage of revenue column. So of course, um, it would be any of these items divided by revenue or net sales. So of course, the net sales divided by net sales is going to be 100%. And remember, revenues is the same thing as sales or net sales or net revenues. Okay, so the next part we'll have is operating expenses. So these are the expenses for operating the business. The cost of goods sold are the materials <clears throat> and labor to make your products. SG and A expense, this is where you'll most likely be a part of SG and A. These are the finance people, the sales people, the marketing people, the human resources, uh, the administrative expenses to run a company other expenses, depreciation, and then total operating expenses. And this gets deducted from your income to give you earnings before interest and tax, which is sometimes um, called EBIT, operating income. Now, if we take away our interest expense, we get our taxable income, take away our taxes, we get our net income. 
And that could be, um, the income could be uh, either two ways. There are only two ways to really um, spend the net income. It's either going to be given out as dividends to investors or it's going to be added to the uh, addition of retained earnings. Okay, so let's look at Home Depot's balance sheet. So in this balance sheet, again, we're going to be looking on the asset side. We're going to compare everything to a percentage of assets. So back here, we did everything as a percentage of, rev of sales or revenues. So this shows us that cost of goods sold is 65% of revenue. So that means for every dollar in sales, you have 65 cents goes to the cost of goods, 16 cents goes to the selling and, and uh, general administration expenses. Um, 4.8% cents goes to taxes, 1% one, 1 to, or 1 cent to interest expense. So it's just baking, breaking the, the revenue down in percentages so we know where our sales dollars are going. So the remaining net income is only 8.4% of sales is your net income. And we do the same percentile here, but we use the percentage of assets here. And then here, um, we also use the percentage of assets on this side. So this, so this is a typical balance sheet where this side of the balance sheet, total assets, have to match total liabilities and shareholders equity on this side. And you see how these numbers are the same. And the assets are listed in the most current to the most long term. So cash, receivables, inventory, uh, fixed assets, property, equipment, tangible fixed assets. Uh, so we get to our total assets. So we break it down into total current assets and total fixed assets than total assets. So liabilities, the same thing. Current liabilities, like accounts payable, uh, and then long-term debt, long-term liabilities. So we get to total liabilities, and we add to that any change in shareholders' equity, money that the share are directly tied to the shareholders, like retained earnings, uh, money brought in from stock purchases or sales, uh, and we get our total liabilities and shareholders' equity. Now, the, st the statement of cash flows, Here's where we look at the cash coming in and out of the company. So we have the net income, the, which is this net income. See this net income here from the income statement. We bring that over here to the cash flow statement. And then we start chipping away. So we have changes on, on our cash. So depreciation is generally added back because depreciation is a non-cash charge. It's a deduction on the income statement so here we, we deduct um, depreciation expense from our income, but it's a non-cash charge, meaning that we should add that back to the cash flow. Why is it a non-cash charge? Well, because say you're driving your car around and, and it's December 31st, now it's January 1st, your car is now classified in the next year and the car depreciates. Also, you may put more miles in your car. You could have a couple scratches in your car. The value of the car is going to depreciate. So as far as your assets look, the value of your assets have decreased. Or the um, now that the de depreciation, you don't actually have to pay anybody money. Oh, my car depreciated by 3000 You give 3000 to somebody. No, cash doesn't change. Uh, but the value of the car does change. And in, for companies, not for individuals, you can deduct depreciation from your income, which helps to lower your uh, taxable income. That's why the accounting profits are different than the economic profits because of things, non-cash charges like depreciation. So we always add that back. Now, any changes in working capital, um, when we're increasing or decreasing inventories, uh, receivables, so if we're increasing inventories and receivables, that takes cash to increase those. So that is a reduction to your cash. So in the cash flow statement, we're looking at the change of cash going in and out from the operating the company is one section. The next section would be the change of cash from investments. Um, money being changed from buying and selling uh, investments, which could be tangible fixed assets or, uh, or selling or buying land for example, and then we have cash by fi provided by finance activities, borrowing money, is, you know, issuing dividends, or paying dividends um, is the same thing. It's gonna take cash away from us. Issuing, um, borrowing money in any form is gonna be additional money coming into financing. So these three areas added together becomes our increase or decrease from uh, our cash. Now you see this 
this 330 here is the, the overall net of all this information. So it helps us to break that, in, that cash flow information. So we have a better idea of where our cash is going. Now, measuring the form's performance, performance, what we want to do is we want to enhance shareholder value. So if we make the right investment decisions, we buy the right assets, um, and we have the right mix of profitability of our sales, meaning setting, raising prices here and um, reducing or making assets be more effective or less costly, it's going to be good investment decisions. Financing decisions is how much uh, leverage the company is going to use and the liquidity, liquidity of the company, how liquid the company is as far as the amount of current assets to current liabilities. These all help to enhance shareholder value. So financial ratios are going to help us measure the success of these decisions. Okay, so as far as the profitability of investments in real assets, we want to look at the return on assets, return on equity, return on capital, economic value added. So we want to see, are the assets being used efficiently, effectively, meaning that you don't want to buy a manufacturing production plant and only make 10 cars out of it, you want to make a million cars out of it. It's more effective. You're running the factory um, more efficiently. And the financing decisions. How much leverage uh, is the company taking? And do they have enough cash and liquidity to coverage that, cover that leverage? Okay, so let's look at some profitability measures. So here we have return on assets. And it's EBIT, sometimes known as operating income, divided by total assets. So we want to know what type of what type of percentage return are the assets delivering so the more income the assets generate the better so for example if you have an asset say it's a factory and you're only running that factory um eight hours a day and then you decide to run the factory 24 hours a day now the factory is going to be a much more effective asset and if you can sell all the products that the factory is generating 24 hours a day uh, at a profit, you'll have a higher EBIT. Now, return on capital. So this is the EBIT divided by the long-term capital. So again, this, this is sort of a sub-variant of return on assets. But here we're just looking at long-term capital. And we're trying to see, is the long-term capital that we invest in the company producing a good return? Now, return on equity is net income divided by shareholders equity. So this is really looking at the return on what the shareholders, the money the shareholders have given the company. So we want to see um, for that, maybe we gave the company $10 million. What type of net income is that generating? So this is the return on equity, a very important uh, ratio because it really me measures, it's a good way of looking at um, maximizing shareholders wealth. Now, financial leverage, this is looking at, um, we can, well, this is financial leverage and return on equity. So here, if we take the return on equity can equal one minus the tax rate times return on assets plus return on assets minus interest uh, multiplied by debt to equity. So this is all how you can break down the return on, on equity. And so the return on equity you want to understand how much leverage there is in the company and how much interest you're paying on that leverage. So, and for example, if you had $100,000, you can open up a store and, uh, and fully pay for it. So you own one store and 100% equity. And if that store makes $10,000, you had a 10% return on your equity. Now, what if you took that $100,000 and you put it down as collateral and borrowed another 900,000. So now you have a million dollars, 10% equity, 90% debt, and you open up 10 stores. So now you've opened up 10 stores. Each store makes $10,000. So now you've made $100,000, which is 100% return on the $100,000 of equity you had, but you're much more financially leveraged. So using financial leverage, you can increase return on equity, which is a good thing. But if you're too financially leveraged, you may have to, um, the company will become more risky because there's a chance that you can't pay the loans off. 
So if a situation occurs where you can't operate your business for a few months, now you might be defaulting on those loans and the bank's going to take your business. So using leverage is good, but too much leverage makes your company risky. Uh, and that might make investors shy, make investors scare your company or not want to invest as heavily in your company. Okay, so let's look at this company's uh, business cycle. So they have a bad year, a normal year, and a good year. We can see how that affects sales. Uh, operating income, also known as EBIT, which stands for Earnings Before Interest and Tax. See how that changes. Return on Assets. So, of course, you get a higher return the more sales you have. Net profits increase and return on equity increases as well. So you see that increasing sales is key as long as those sales turn into increasing, increased earnings. Uh, and that will help drive return on, return on assets, net profit, and return on equity. Now, the impact of financial leverage on return on equity. So, again... If we're looking at this, um, so we have two different companies and we'll say that this company, here we say after tax equals EBIT, equity. Okay, this company has only 16 million in equity. So this company would be not, not this, this company is more financially leveraged. So you can see that in a bad year, they're, the leverage has caused their uh, return on earnings to be lower than the less leveraged company. But in a good year, the more highly leveraged company is going to have a higher uh, return on equity compared to um, a less leveraged company. So this is this demonstration of leverage can affect the return on equity. So just because a company has a very high return on equity, that's good, but it may be bad if that return equity uh, constitutes a higher level of risk for the company. Now, another way to measure profitability is economic value added. So here we're going to look at the measure of a dollar value of the firm's returns in excess of the opportunity costs. So what we're really talking about here is if we take, you know, if we look at the, the cost of capital, and then we see that if the earnings are larger than the cost of capital, then we know the company has created some economic value. Uh, so basically, it's just a very simple way to say, okay, here's the capital pool that we borrowed from. Here's the cost of all that capital. Did we earn more than the, the cost of the capital? If so, then we created economic value. Okay, so here we could look at a few companies. So here's the economic value uh, added. The capital pool return on assets, and the cost of capital. So in all of these cases, except for AT&T and Honda, the companies created uh, more value than the cost of their capital. Uh, and this you can see by the return on assets shows who has the most, Home Depot would have the most profitable assets. Okay, so if we decompose the return on equity. So return on equity, since there's so many factors that can go into the change of return to equity, some good, some less good, we want to understand really where this change in equity is coming from. So we could break down that formula by a series of financial ratios. So return to equity, we have our net profits divided by equity. Would is what how we our base of how we calculate return to equity, which could also be net profit divided by pre-tax profit times pre-tax profit divided by EBIT times EBIT divided by sales times sales divided by assets times assets divided by equity. So you can see that if you crossed out all the numerators and denominators uh, in this, you'd be, you'd be left with just net profits and equity. But, but since we break it out fully, we could see if we're looking at each of these categories, which one of these categories um, if we look especially year over year, changed to affect the return on equity. So this way we could kind of break down the return on equity to a more nuanced level to see what part of the company is there a problem. So, okay. So the EBIT, EBIT divided by sales would, would calculate 
uh, a profit margin, which would be the operating profit margin. Okay, so total asset turnover, the annual sales generated by each dollar of assets. So it's assets divided by sales. Okay, so here we want to see how effective are the assets of generating sales. So say you have a store and the store only operates four hours a day. And in that four hours a day, you, 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 set, you sell um, you know, $10,000 worth of sales. So now if you open the store up for 24 hours a day and then you wind up selling $100,000 worth of sales a day, you can see how now that asset, the store, is generating more sales, which is good. That's why we like to see an increasing amount of total asset turnover. Also, say you have a pizza oven and the pizza oven uh, takes you know, an hour to cook a pizza. So you can see that it's not gonna, you're not going to be able to sell a lot of pizzas and then you decide to change, buy a new oven or get an, uh, you get an uh, enhancement of this oven that it can cook at higher temperatures and cook the pizzas faster. So now you could sell 10 times the amount of pizzas in one day than you did before. So that would make the asset more effective and generate more sales. So we always want to think about how can our assets generate more sales, whether we can operate them faster, longer, uh, or more efficient so there's less um, defects, we want our assets to be more effective. Okay, interest coverage ratio. So here we're looking at how much interest do we have relative to the amount of money we have to cover it. So it's a measure of, it's a financial uh, le leverage measure, and we take EBIT divided by interest expense. So, this, so the higher this multiple, the better. So think of it about in your life. If you had uh, a monthly income of, a, of 2,000 euros and you divide that by your interest expense of 500 euros, you have four times your coverage ratio. So you have four times the ability to pay your interest. If your interest was 2,000 euros and your income is 2,000 euros, you only have one time. So you see how that's very risky. You have no other money to pay for anything else. Okay, continuing, uh, leverage ratio. So the measure of debt to total capitalization of a, fir of a firm. So here we could look at the tax burden times the interest burden times the margin times turnover times leverage. So this would also equal return on equity. So the return on assets is the margin times the turnover would calculate return on assets. So it's really just showing you, um, and I'll show you later in a spreadsheet how this looks, but it's just, you know, trying to de, um, dissect return on earnings, I'm sorry, return on equity, to get a better idea of what is contributing or detracting from their overall return on equities. And it could be the return on assets is, you know, if the assets are underperforming, that's going to lower your return on equity. So here we have uh, those, two, those two companies again. So if we look at, um, we have three scenarios. So we can look at return on equity in, in for both companies under the three scenarios. So here, um, in a bad year, you can see that the lower leverage company is doing better, but then in a good year, higher leverage company is doing better. So the, the net profit before um, net profit divided by pre-tax profit is the same in all circumstances. And the pre-tax profit divided by the EBIT uh, is different and that's going to reflect the um, the change in pre-tax profit okay so if we look at the margin um, operating this is the operating margin EBIT divided by sales we see that it's equal but the sales divided by assets are also equal equity divided by assets are different since the if so one company is more debt than equity, we're going to have a different um, assets to equity. So the, as far as the leverage coverage, the compound leverage factor, we could see the difference in the leverage factor as the overall change in the um, sales of the company from good year to bad year. So again, it's just trying to help, trying to figure out. We could see here in columns such as four, 
three, one. Um, but there's no, these are not affecting. Um, what's affecting it is the, the asset to equity balance, the pre-tax profit to, to operating earnings balance, and that's what's going to affect the overall list. So two times five is what the compound leverage factor is. And since we have their different results in two and five, we see that we're going to have a different leverage factor. So the higher the number, the more leveraged the company. Okay, so if we look at it across industry, so let me just move this up a little bit. Sorry about that. Cutting off the title here. Let me just pause it. Okay, this is better. There's a title there. Difference between profit margin and asset turnover. Okay, so a supermarket chain has lower profit margins than the utility company. So it's the um, asset turnover, turnover is higher for a supermarket chain than the utility because the supermarket chain has a lot of inventory that turns over quickly, where a utility company has a lot of assets that don't turn over quickly. So the return on assets is uh, equal for both because of even though they have the main contr contribution to return on assets for utility is their high margin, where for supermarket chains, it's their a high asset turnover ratio. So to basically supermarkets make money by selling lots and lots and lots of groceries. So they make a small amount of money on each individual unit of the groceries they sell, but they sell a lot of it. Where utilities uh, sell um, maybe electric, and since they, they don't sell as much, they, uh, and their assets aren't going to turn over as much, they are making their return on assets more on their profitability side. So we can look at this return on assets, profit margin, and asset turnover among different industries. So we can see that food stores have a, a higher asset turnover, but a low operating profit margin. That's because food is a low margin good. So when, a, when you buy an apple, the supermarket may only be making um, 3%. So if, the, if it, you spend a, um, one, uh, one dollar on an apple, the comp the grocery store is only making three cents. Now, if you go to computer peripherals like keyboards and, and a mouse or speakers, they have a much lower turn, asset turnover, but a much higher profit margin. So it's just really about how companies are going to do their business model. Do they want to sell? Is there a high competition where they're selling a lot of goods at a, at a at the price pretty close to their purchase price? Or is it uh, a market where they can mark up the product much higher? Okay, so let's look at, again, ratio analysis. So the, the turnover and asset utilization. So the fixed asset turnover is gonna look at sales to fixed assets. So sales, again, is what the, the amount of money that the company sells, sometimes it's called revenue. Fixed assets are the more longer term assets, plants, equipment, uh, machinery. So this gives a, uh, an idea of how, how the fixed assets are generating sales, so the multiple sales to fixed assets. Now the industry turnover ratio is the cost, cost of goods sold, cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. So what we want to know here is how many turns is the inventory taking? So think of a toy store, okay? Now, if you fill that toy store up on the first day of the month with all the toys that they're going to need for that month, and by the end of the month, the store is completely empty, and they do that every month, we'll say the inventory turned over 12 times. And another example, say a toy store buys all the toys they're going to sell for the year. So the beginning of the year, they have all their toys. They don't make any additional purchases. At the end of the year, they're out of all their toys. That would be one turn of inventory. Now think about how ineffective it would be for a toy store to buy all the toys at the beginning of the year. Where are they gonna store all those toys? They have to pay for extra storage. They have to buy all those toys and spend all that money up front. Very wasteful. And what if the toy industry changes? New toys are released or change, taste changes. Now you're stuck with selling these old toys. In your personal life, think about 
you say you like a particular cereal, like cornflakes, and you eat one box of cornflakes a week. So you buy 52 boxes in January 1st to represent your inventory of cornflakes for the whole year. Now you have to get a storage unit to store your extra cereal because it won't fit in your apartment. So that's an extra cost. There could be spoilage or waste or uh, pest rodents could be eating it. Uh, there could be theft. Uh, now also, maybe halfway through the year, you just are sick of cornflakes and don't want to eat them anymore. So the rest of it goes unused and you start buying a different cereal that you like better. So you can see that's just some, some examples of why this industry turnover ratio is good to look at. Sometimes called inventory turnover ratio. Average collection period. How quickly do you collect your accounts receivable uh, per dollar of daily sales? So here we're looking at, you know, the, does it take you 30 days to collect your money, 60 days? Uh, 120 days, so this could be a, a percentage or a, do, a day amount. So here we're really trying to figure out how efficient is your company at collecting receivables. So accounts receivables are money you lend out to customers and that you're waiting for them to pay you. And it's usually business to business that sell on credit like that. Now let's look at the liquidity ratios. So here we want to see how liquid the company is, which is going to measure how safe the company is as far as lending money. Um, I'm sorry, as far as them borrowing money from a lender. So if you borrow too much money, then you're less, you're going to be less liquid as a company. Um, so it's going to look at your, your current assets and your current liabilities. And what's the ability to convert assets into cash in a short notice? So, so the current ratio is going to look at current assets divided by current liabilities. And the higher the number here, the more effective your current ratio, your, the more liquid your, your company is, the more less risky your company is. So say you had a lot of cash, that was your current asset, and your current liabilities were, you know, say you had a million dollars of cash and your current liabilities were 50,000, very liquid company. Now the quick ratio is going to be a very similar method um, ratio. It's also sometimes called the asset test ratio, but the quick ratio is going to be the same measure except we're going to exclude inventory. So why would we exclude inventory? Well, because inventory is not equal between companies. So you could have a company whose inventory uh, is something readily, uh, readily sold or easily converted into cash. And you could have a company whose inventory, maybe the inventory is cars. So vehicles take a long time to sell and you can't easily convert those into cash. You know, if another company's inventory was gold, that's pretty easily converted into cash. So the quick ratio says exclude the inventories to see how liquid the company is without the inventories as part of their current assets. Now the cash ratio is going to look at the uh, cash and marketable securities to current liabilities. Marketable securities is like a money market account, pretty much pretty close to cash. So again here, you know, if say you're a bank and I'm looking at you and you have $100,000 of money in the bank, and you owe a thousand dollars of interest a month on your credit cards, I would say that your cash ratio is sufficient, pretty good. So here is a example of a growth industries uh, financial statement. So you can see here that you know if we look at their income statement, their sales are growing, and their net income is growing. No, actually, the net income is decreasing here. So why is their net income decreasing? Well, they have a higher cost of goods sold, uh, and it looks like there are many of the categories specifically operating um, interest expense has gone up a great deal. So if we're looking at an industry here that's taking on additional borrowing, we can see that's going to affect their overall um, riskiness. All right. So let's look at market price ratios. So whenever you see the term market in finance, we mean stock market, okay? So it says market price, we mean stock price. So just think of market as a shorthand for stock market. So market price ratios, um, market to book uh, value ratio. So this is the, the market price of a share divided by the book value per share. So we covered book value before. It's basically assets minus liabilities 
you get your equity divided by outstanding shares you get your equity per share or sometimes known as book value per share so you want to see how many times the stock price is trading above the book value per share so think of book value also as if you had a company and decided to sell all the assets pay off all your liabilities and you're left with just the value of the company divide that by the amount of shares you get your book value per share so book value is just the the value of the company after all the liabilities are satisfied and it's the remainder of your assets so if a company is trading at hundred dollars per share and their book value is 10 uh, compared to a company identical company that has hundred dollars per share and a book value of one you could see that this is an indicator of, of confidence in the company if we see how many times the book value of the company is trading at. Price to earnings ratio, we've talked about before. So this is the ratio of the stock price to the earnings per share, also commonly known as the PE ratio. And this is, again, the multiple the stock is trading above its earnings. So if the earnings were $5 a share, the stock is trading at $50 a share, the PE would be 10 or the stock price 10 divided by earnings 5 gives you a PE of 10. Right, the stock price of 50 divided by earnings of 5 would give you a PE of 10. And, it, and it's, you know, gives you a gauge of how valued the company is. The higher the PE number, the more highly valued the company is. So return to earnings, return to equity um, can be broken down as earnings divided by book value, uh, which is the, could be uh, the market share, the market stock market price divided by book value, divided by the um, the market price divided by earnings. So these again, the return on earnings can be broken down into many ways. So it could be the price to book ratio divided by the PE multiple. That's pretty much what this is showing here. Okay, so if we look at the leveraged uh, ratios. We have the interest burden. So this is going to tell you what our interest burden is. Uh, interest coverage, how many times our, our, our earnings are above, uh, compared to our interest expense. Our leverage, what our leverage is of the company, which is how much of our assets are paid by debt. And compound leverage factor, which is going to be interest burden times the leverage. So asset utilization here we're looking at how effectively is the company utilizing its assets. So this total asset turnover encompasses all the assets. How effective are all the assets at generating sales? Here, fixed asset turnover is how effective the fixed assets are at generating sales. Inventory turnover looks at how quickly the company turns the inventory and the higher the number of turns, the more effective the company is. And then the days, day, uh, day sales in receivable the smaller this number is, the quicker the company converts their accounts receivable into payments. As far as liquidity ratios, uh, we have our current ratio, which looks at current assets to current liabilities, our quick ratio. You might see this called the asset test, test ratio. And this is looking at if we take away, if we don't include our inventories, what does our current ratio look like without our inventories? We have our cash ratio to measure the overall level of cash the company has compared to current liabilities. Okay, and the profitability measures, we have our return on assets. What, how, many pro, how much profit do our assets generate? Return on equity, how much, equ, how much return do, of profit do our, does the equity in the company generate? And then a return on sales, which is the EBID, EBIT, which is the operating profits divided by sales. So this would be the operating profit margin. We, have, we talked about the, the market to book, which is the market value compared to the book value of the company. The price of the stock compared to the earnings of the company is the PE ratio and the earnings yield. So the earnings yield is the earnings uh, of the company divided by the price of the stock. Okay, so if we look at the DuPont composition of Home Depot. So DuPont is a methodology for reviewing financial ratios. So what it basically does is it stacks the financial ratios up uh, into different tiers to try to pinpoint which item in the income statement or balance sheet is the problem causing overall return on equity to increase or decrease. The problem would be if it made the equity decrease, the return on equity. 
So here, if we look at the, this is the turnover rate, the return on assets. So I'm assuming this is the turnover of assets and profit margin. So we could see that as the turnover rate increases, the turns of assets, we're increasing the, the efficiency of the assets, the percentage return on assets increase and overall profit margins increase. So this, this slide is just basically saying that for Home Depot, if they increase the utilization of their assets, return on assets and profit margins go up. So Home Depot has stores and inside the stores they have, they have inventory that they sell. So those are their assets. So if they open up the stores for longer hours or buy new stores in better locations and sell more goods more effectively at higher profit margins, they're going to have a higher return on those assets. So the better the management does at increasing the sales, maybe through advertising, maybe through better pricing, better locations, the overall more profitable the company has become over the years. So if we look at uh, major industry groups, so Different companies or different industry, different companies within different industries have um, need to be measured against each other. You don't want to take grocery store companies and start looking at them compared to aerospace companies. So we want to look at companies within their industries to get a better idea of how they their results compared to the industry averages. So you can see that between different industries, they have overall for all the the, the major uh, ratios, they have different averages. Some industries, the most profitable industry would be the drug industry, and the least profitable industry here would be the motor vehicle industry. So this would just be a way of looking at how industries differ. This is not all industries. You shouldn't compare one stock and one industry, industry to a different stock in a completely different industry. So let's talk about growth industries. So these are industries that uh, they have high growth in sales. They may, may require an increasing amount of assets and hopefully operating income increases at least by 20%. Um, they could have a declining return on equity as they're taking on more debt to grow the company, but return on assets are not declining because the assets are generating more and more sales because it's a growth company. So we have a rapid increase in year to year short-term debt and interest expense as the company is borrowing money to fund their assets to satisfy a growing demand for their product. So here be example, some key financial ratios of the growth industry. So we can see here that um, return on equity is, is changing as the company is changing their overall growth and growing larger. Um, and we can see how that affects, you know, the compound leverage and uh, different variables throughout the growth of the company. So if we look at here would be the cash flow for a growing company. We can see the change in cash flow as they're making more investments. The company uh, here, net income can be shrinking as if even though the company's growing, perhaps you're spending more money as you are here uh, in buying inventories and, and interest expenses in their financing. So that's how we would want to analyze a growth company. We have to keep in special understanding the company's growing. So cost takes a lot of additional capital um, and leverage to keep that company growing. Okay, so compar comparability problems. Now, all not all companies have the same methodologies for how they value their inventory or the depreciation. So when you look at different companies within the same industry, and we might see different ratios, some of that can be impacted by their accounting and their accounting standards. So one way is the inventory valuation. We have LIFO and FIFO. So LIFO is last in, first out inventory valuation, and FIFO is first in, first out inventory. So think of LIFO would be good for like a perishable business where the product that was that, um, Oh, let me switch it to FIFO. FIFO would be better for a perishable industry. So the the first the we want to sell the first in products first out. So that means if we get we had milk was the first to come in with expiration date in January, and then new milk comes in with expiration date in February, the first milk that came in, we want to first push that out because we don't want that to expire. So we'd never sell the first in products at the longer expiration dates. 
but the last in first out would be an inventory situation where uh, maybe it's some sort of commodity where it doesn't expire expire and if the last in had a higher inventory value we probably would want to move that out first to keep our inventories low so these are just two inventory methods of how you're going to move your inventory what's going to be moved out of your inventory soonest and it really depends on the type of business you have and the type of product you're selling but if you're looking at two different if two different companies take two different approaches to their inventory valuations holding the same exact inventory and uh, using the same amount of inventory per year they could have vastly different values to the inventory depending on how they account for um, what's how the inventory moves okay now as far as depreciation uh, this is something I was talking about before, depreciation. This is a non-cash charge. So I explained to you that if you have an asset that depreciates, so in your life, your car or your computer may depreciate, that doesn't mean that you had to give money to anybody. It just means that you're, if you want to resell your car or your laptop, um, it's not worth as much as it was. But if you're not selling the asset, there's no real visible change in your bank account. So in the accounting of depreciation, we're going to take the, the cost of the asset oh, and depreciate it for each accounting period and we're still gonna lower our tax liability. But in the economic real world, the amount of operating cash that must be reinvested in the firm um, is going, not gonna be affected by depreciation. So depreciation, this non-cash charge of it, and the reason companies wanna uh, recognize this non-cash charge as a deduction to their profits is for tax purposes. It benefits them, lowers your tax um, liabilities. Okay, Fair value accounting is another way uh, to use current market values rather than historic costs in the firm's financial statements. So this relies heavily on estimates, but it's another way of, you know, companies want to show, accounting wise, companies want to make, um, utilize the accounting methods that are going to make the company look best. So. A fair use could be a way of um, reviewing both both scenarios and see which is going to be better for the company as far as their taxable liabilities. So quality of earnings. So when a company, you know, if we have look at two different companies and they have the same earnings, both companies have twenty five dollars a share earnings. We have to dig a little deeper. Well, how realistic and sustainable are those earnings? And and factors that can affect the quality of earnings is. Is the allowance for bad debts accurate? Allowance for bad debts is a reserve of money uh, that we expect to compensate for the expected amount of people who just are not going to pay us. So we lend money out to a number of companies. Some of them won't pay us. So if we underfund this allowance for bad debts or overfund this allowance for bad debts, it can affect the quality of our earnings. Uh, Non-recurring items. So if the company had a big tax gain or um, a big lawsuit win for the year that's not likely to reoccur, then that could artificially make their earnings for the year look much higher than average. So you should really just look into it and say, okay, their earnings are quadrupled this quarter, but that wasn't related to operations. That was related to non, non-recurring items that are not going to come back again. So we need to take those out as far as looking at the company realistically. Earnings smoothing. This is where companies will try to smooth out their earnings, where they'll they'll try to plan or land their earnings at particular months or quarters. So, um, say for example, uh, the second quarter is not doing well, they might try to advance some sales from the third quarter into the second quarter to to smooth out those those er, uh, earnings results, and that is going to kind of mislead investors to the true uh, activity of the quarter. How companies re, uh, process their revenue recognition. So the way companies have a certain leeway on their revenue recognition that can affect the overall sales and profits for the quarter. Now, and some companies can Ill- illegally falsify revenue recognition. And some companies like Luck and Coffee just make up fake revenues. Off balance sheet assets and liabilities. This is where the this is something companies have done in the past where they make an off balance sheet uh, entity. So they create another company or subsidiary or or another um, uh, area where they can take 
assets and liabilities and move them off their current main balance sheets and income statements. So it's basically sort of like hiding. It's kind of like you want to clean your room up, but you don't want to spend a lot of time. So you'll shovel everything into your closet and close your door. So you put all your toys and clothes and books in the closet and you close the closet door and suddenly your room looks clean. But that's really just hiding um, the messy stuff. And so if companies are aggressively taking off balance sheet assets and liabilities or placing your assets and liabilities off balance sheet, hiding them in a sense, that could affect really the quality of their earnings. So basically, um, you can't always just look at the ratios and the earnings at face value, you sometimes have to do some investigating, some digging, that's what a financial analyst will do, to try to figure out really what the full company's composition is. Now, there are different standards internationally than domestically. So it's quite possible for each country to have their own set of accounting standards, but there are some international accounting uh, conventions that help to uh, homogenize the accounting results worldwide for companies. So, so for example, if you have a company and you want to list on the American Stock Exchange, you may have to conf uh, conform to American accounting regulations or international agreed upon international accounting con uh, conventions. So, for example, uh, reserving practices, some are subject to, to more managerial discretion in the U.S. and other countries. Depreciation, other countries do not allow dual sets of accounts. Uh, most firms in foreign countries use accelerated depreciation. Uh, intangibles, treatments of, uh, are going to be, uh, how you treat these intangibles can be very different from country to country. So an intangible will be like a trademark or a copyright. So sort of like a character like Wolverine. It's not a physical asset, but it's an intangible asset. Wolverine, Spider-Man are worth a lot of money. But it's just a fake character with no real asset behind it. It's intangible. You can't touch it. But you can put it in a movie. You can write a story about it. You can make a comic book. You can make merchandising. So how these intangibles are valued um, can differ. So if you have a bag of gold, you can weigh that and put a specific value on that gold. But if you have a very popular character, what is the real value of that? Okay. International uh, Continuing this international accounting conventions, um, International Financial Reporting Standards, the IFRS, is a set of standards, and uh, so it's a principle-based set of standard rules adopted by more than 100 countries, including the European Union. So this is a way of trying to homogenize the accounting results between many different companies around the world, so it's easier to make comparisons and judge overall performance between companies that have different um, countries of origin. So you can see here, the adjusted versus the reported price to earnings ratio. So here would be the reported, but if we adjust it using the homogenized international accounting standards, you can see that they're quite different in many countries uh, with uh, Austria, I'm sorry, Australia and Japan being two of the biggest differentials uh, where the United Kingdom, Switzerland, and France are not much of a difference between reported and actual. Okay, so that's the end of the, the chapter here. Now, uh, I want you to uh, look for the spreadsheet continuation of this chapter where I'm gonna show you a spreadsheet uh, of financial ratios and how you can organize financial ratios in a way to better help understand the financial performance of a company. Okay, thank you for this chapter and I'll see you next time.